Bear Walker by Joseph Bruchak Chapter 14 Coleman Lanterns We're back inside the main building. I'm sitting in the corner near the big fireplace, where a pile of logs burns so hot that I'm sweating. But I'm not about to stop putting logs on the fire. Po Boy has his head on my knee, and I'm petting him with one hand and writing with the other. A lot of people seem to have finally fallen asleep. But not me. I couldn't sleep even if I hadn't volunteered to be the firekeeper and be in charge of the Coleman Lanterns. So much has happened since we got back from the fire circle that I don't know where to start. So I'll just make a list in my journal of, as Mr. Wilbur puts it, the pertinent points. Point number one. Mr. Mack and the one who calls himself Walker White Bear, have vanished. So have the other two people I haven't really mentioned before. Two men whose names I never got, who were brought in by Mr. Mack as counselors. They hung back when our bus came in and none of us, Mr. Wilbur included, ever got a good look at them. We were supposed to be introduced to them. But then everything got crazy. I wonder if they are as incompetent at being camp personnel as the other two. I wonder what they really were hired to do. I wonder what all four of them are doing now. Point number two. The power lines to the camp seem to have been cut. There's no electricity at all, and there's a deep darkness all around because the sky is still clouded over. Point number three. There's also no emergency power here. A backup generator is supposed to kick in if there's any kind of power failure, like a tree being blown down in a storm over the lines. But as we walked back to the main hall, everything was still dark, except for one faint light that appeared to be bobbing on the porch of the building. It turned out to be Mrs. Osgood holding up an old kerosene lamp she just lit. The emergency generator was not working she told us, but not in those few words. When Mr. Philo took a look at it, the first thing he noticed was that the cap was off the gas tank. He put a stick in to measure how much gas was there, and when that stick scraped on something gritty, he shook his head in disgust. It's been sabotaged, he said. Someone poured sand into the tank. Point number four. It has been decided that everyone is going to spend the night together here in the main building. Mrs. Osgood brought out half a dozen Coleman lanterns and lit them. Although I have to pump them up every now and then to keep the fuel flowing, and they give off a faint roaring sound. They also provide almost as much light as a 100-watt bulb. So even though the room is filled with strange shadows, it is light enough to give most folks a sense of security. Mr. Wilbur organized details to go to the cabins and bring the foam mattresses from the bunks and all of our stuff into here. The room has been divided into a boy's side and a girl's side, with most of the adults sleeping in a line down the middle of the room where they have set up half a dozen cots. Mr. and Mrs. Philo are in two cots near where I'm sitting in the corner by the fire, furthest away from any of the doors. Mrs. Osgood is on another cot next to the door that leads into the kitchen. It's good that this big building doubles as the dining hall, and that the food is also stored in here. I have all of my necessities, Mrs. Osgood said, when she met us with her lantern, pointing at a long bag she'd propped in a chair on the porch. So I calculate that we all can be snug as a nest of bugs in a rug, with what with food and fire and, and so on. And I suppose we are snug in here, even though it is stuffy, with all of the windows in the building closed and latched as tight as doors. No one is supposed to leave the building until dawn. There are two bathrooms in this main building, and buckets of water have been brought from the lake so that the cabin toilets can keep functioning. I guess those are all the main points that I need to list. Everyone is keeping calm. Things are organized to keep everyone safe. But I don't think we are safe. None of the adults are talking about the how and why of all this. 
Maybe they don't want to alarm us or they think the kids just live in the moment and are not concerned with things like the future. I am, though. My mind is running through scenarios as I try to put this puzzle together, even though I think there are still pieces missing. There has to be a plan behind this, a logical reason for what has happened so far. I haven't quite figured out what, but I think I know why from eavesdropping on Mr. Wilbur's earlier conversation with Mrs. Smiler. I think the result is supposed to be the end of Camp Chuckamuck and the selling of the property for all that money. That seems obvious to me. Make the camp fail and then it has to be sold. But there's an even darker side. Mr. and Mrs. Philo. Someone must have tricked those kind old people into coming here and getting trapped. It may mean that the plan behind it all is really an evil one. It may mean that someone wants to do away with them so that they'll no longer be around to prevent their land from being sold. But how do the people who are doing this expect to get away with it? I think about Mr. Osgood. Even though I just met him and his wife, I know in my heart that they could not be part of a, the plan to do harm to anyone. He's our biggest hope for rescue, because until he reaches the outside, no one will know that we're all in trouble and caught here. I look at my watch. 11 o'clock p.m. He should have reached a phone long ago. People might be on their way here already. Unless he never reached a phone. Unless something happened to him. I try not to think about that, but turning my thoughts from him turns them back to us. It's like looking away from the edge of a precipice to see a monster creeping up on you. What about the rest of us? Is something supposed to happen to us, too? Will the ones who have planned this see us as witnesses and thus dangerous to them? I shiver again at where this train of thought is leading me. The only silent witnesses are dead witnesses. Could this be so cold-hearted and evil a plan that killing about 40 people is part of it? But it couldn't be. That kind of plan wouldn't just be cold-hearted. It would be insane. Suddenly we hear a thud of footsteps on the porch and pounding on the door. Let me in! A voice screams from outside. He's gone crazy! He's trying to kill me!